I don't know if any of you uh, who are here right now brought the Signs and Wonders manual with you today. If you did, turn to page 65 because uh, we're going to be uh, basically following the information that is here. We'll be supplementing that with some other things, but uh, we're on page 65. Sister, um, Sister Odell, our bookstore manager, will come back at, um, after this session is over. And right before we do the panel discussion, and she'll have some more copies of this manual just in case you want it. Because it does have, uh, as you've seen, a chapter on each of the nine spiritual gifts with kind of definitions of the gifts, examples of them at work, some things we've discovered. Um, and then it has other information that's more general in nature, but all of it's about the spiritual gifts. So that could have some long-term help for you. Uh, to begin this morning, let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And let's notice uh, what this list includes here, and then we'll focus on these two. The primary reason we're focusing on these two is because they seem often to work together. Uh, Word of knowledge and word of wisdom. Many of these gifts work in tandem with each other. Where you see one, you'll you'll typically see others at work. Um, But here today in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and uh, starting at verse 8, For to one is given, the very first one mentioned, the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. And then the rest of the gifts there are listed. So we do have a gift that is specifically called the word of wisdom. And then another that's called the word of knowledge. Now let's get a little background, some some ideas here, and then we'll look at some examples in Scripture. And then I'll mention... Uh, some illustrations that, that uh, are current illustrations that may be helpful. First of all, we need to distinguish between just wisdom and this gift of the word of wisdom. Now, we're not talking here about the gift of wisdom. And we're not, we won't be talking about the gift of knowledge. Biblically, there really is no such thing as the gift of wisdom or the gift of knowledge. The Bible talks about wisdom that you can uh, learn. The book of Proverbs says wisdom is the principal thing. With all of your getting, get wisdom and get understanding. But that's wisdom that you can learn by study. It's wisdom that you can learn by observation in life. Uh, it's, It's something that's available to anyone who's willing to apply himself or herself. Uh, That's not the supernatural gift of the word of wisdom. It's very valuable, but it's it's something different. Also, James says in James chapter 1, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Uh, That is a wisdom that you can receive as an answer to prayer. You need wisdom in a particular situation. But that's not the same thing as the gift of the word of wisdom. God may give you wisdom again for a particular situation in your life, something you're, you're needing God's direction on. But uh, it, that's something else, too. It's just like the gift of faith, which we're not talking about here today. There's actually at least three different kinds of faith mentioned in the New Testament. There's the faith that's required for salvation. That's one thing. There is um, also the faith that is the fruit of the Spirit in the book of Galatians. But then there's also something called the gift of faith. And, but but they, all, they may have some similarities, but they have different functions. They're really different things. And so today we're talking about the word of wisdom, and and we have a little definition here that we're not claiming this is an infallible definition. I don't have a verse to quote on this definition, but it just kind of is what it seems to be to us, an observation. The gift of the word of wisdom may be defined as a small portion, that's why it's a word, a small portion of God's total wisdom supernaturally imparted by the Holy Spirit. In other words, God is not going to give you all the wisdom he has. That would blow your mind. It's like he's not going to give you all the knowledge he has. But he does give, you, give us, upon occasion, a word or a small portion of his wisdom or a small portion of his knowledge for some purpose in ministry. So it's supernaturally imparted. It's not something you conjure up. By the way, forget psychic abilities. We're not talking about that. It's not something that you... Uh, 
you know, look at somebody and try to assess uh, something about their body language or something. None of that stuff is involved here. This is supernatural impartation where God just drops a word of wisdom or later a word of knowledge into your heart, into your mind for you to share with someone else. Wisdom. Let's let's distinguish between wisdom and knowledge. Knowledge is information. Knowledge is facts. Uh, We'll talk later about what kind of facts it may be. But wisdom is knowing what to do with information. Now, you can have all the knowledge in the world, but uh, as you know, but if you don't have wisdom, you're still going to foul up. Because you have to know what to do with that knowledge. And in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 10 and verse 10, the Bible says, If the iron be blunt, talking about an axe here, and he do not whet the edge or sharpen the edge of that axe, then he must put to more strength. But wisdom is profitable to direct. That's Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 10. The idea there is that wisdom provides direction. So if we just want to come right to the point, the purpose of the word of wisdom, the gift of the word of wisdom is to help people find direction as to what to do in specific situations. Now, you know, you could probably chop down a tree with a blunt axe. It would just take a lot longer and be a lot messier and require a lot more energy. But if you've got a sharp axe, Ecclesiastes is saying, you can chop down that tree much more quickly, much more cleanly, and with not nearly as much physical exertion. That's why I think some folks have called the spiritual gifts God's power tools. In other words, you might could get the job done without the spiritual gifts, but it's just so much more difficult and it takes so much longer and, uh, and, and it can be pretty messy too to, to, to get it done without the spiritual gifts. But God has given us these gifts to enable us, among other things, to quickly deal with the problems and situations that arise and, and to get it done in a way that would glorify Him. So wisdom is profitable to direct or to give direction. Now, wisdom and knowledge, of course, they work hand in hand. Wisdom needs knowledge to work with, and knowledge has to be directed by wisdom because it is possible to use knowledge unwisely. The Bible indicates that's true in Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 2. And even in the New Testament, Paul even wrote in uh, the book of uh, 1 Corinthians that knowledge puffs up. Knowledge puffs up, but charity or love edifies. So, Knowledge is a wonderful thing, but we have to know what to do with the knowledge, and that's why we're talking about the word of wisdom first, and the word of wisdom is the first of the nine gifts that's mentioned. I think it probably has kind of a lower profile than some of the other gifts. We don't think about it as much. It doesn't seem quite as dramatic, you know, to to give someone a word of wisdom. But if you're the one who needs the word, it's very meaningful. And I'll I'll give you some examples uh, from my own life later and how meaningful it has been to me. But uh, I've given some examples here, beginning on page uh, 66, it looks like here, without my glasses on. Some examples of what we think is the word of wisdom at work in Scripture. You can see many of these gifts operating in the life of Jesus. Now, you might say right off the bat, well, that seems kind of weird. Jesus using spiritual gifts? I mean, wasn't he God? Well, he certainly was God, but you have to keep in mind he was also man. And as he walked on this earth, he ministered as an anointed man, according to his own testimony. He said in Luke chapter 4, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel and all these other things that he mentioned there from Isaiah chapter 61. And Jesus is the one who did suggest that his own ministry was to be an example and a pattern for us to follow. He said the things, and I know this is very difficult to comprehend, and I'm sure I don't comprehend it either. But he said, the things that I do, you shall do also. And he even went on to say, and greater things than these shall you do, because I go to my Father. Now, that's something we'd have to spend two or three class sessions on. But the point is, the, the ministry of Jesus is in some way a pattern for us to follow. And so... Uh, If you look in the life of Jesus, you can see occasions where apparently what what he was doing was either the word of wisdom or it was very similar to that. Where he spoke a word that helped give direction to people in specific situations. 
For instance, and you can study these at your own leisure, but for instance, uh, when he told his disciples where and when to fish. And the result was uh, a tremendous catch of fish, but also there was a spiritual result, and that was these fishermen were convicted by what they saw happen. They realized, hey, this is something beyond just the natural here. God is at work in this situation. But uh, perhaps really helpful to us would be some examples in the book of Acts, because we're talking about the church here and, and the people like us in the first century. And there are several cases where you can see wisdom at work in the book of Acts. One, one example. They had a, uh, sometimes we have this idea of the first century church as being just an idyllic uh, paradise of faith, you know, where everybody floated a couple of inches off the ground and kind of had a blue haze around them and halos, you know, that followed them everywhere they went. Really, that's not how it was. They had a lot of trouble in the first century. All you have to do to see that is read the book of Acts and the epistles, and you can see what was going on there. But one of the problems that they had very early in the church is a fuss over a matter as simple as the feeding of the widows. Back in those days, the church provided uh, food for those who were widowed. But the problem was, and this is before the Spirit was even poured out on Gentiles. This is in Acts chapter uh, 6, you can see this. The problem was, although they were mostly all Jewish... There were some Jewish people who were Hellenistic Jews, or they were what we might say Jews who had kind of bought into Greek philosophy. And then there were some of the Jews who were non-Hellenistic Jews, and they were more more loyal to their tradition, to their past. And so they got into a fuss over, are we treating all of these widows, both the Hellenistic and the non-Hellenistic, are we treating them all equally? And some said, well, no, you're showing you know, favoritism to some over others. And so this was such a big problem that they brought it to the apostles. And they said, you guys are going to have to work this out because we're, we're going to divide here over this thing if you don't. And so now the, the, the apostles could have responded to this in human wisdom. They could have said something like, well, okay, if you guys can't handle it, then we will come down there and we'll ladle out the mashed potatoes and the green beans. We'll do it. That would have been one possible solution, kind of a hands-on solution. But it would have taken a great deal of time, two or three times a day, for the apostles to do this. But God gave them a word of wisdom. And here was the word. They said, it is not reasonable for us to leave the word of God and prayer. So God has called us to focus on teaching the word and praying. And it's not reasonable for us to leave that to serve tables. It wasn't the apostles felt like they were too good to serve tables. They just realized that wasn't their calling. And so they said, it's not reasonable for us to do this. So you appoint seven men full of the Holy Ghost and full of faith who can take care of this matter. And so the people did that. They they chose seven men. They brought these names to the apostles. The apostles approved these men and the problem was solved smoothly. It worked well. It was a word of wisdom. And you can see other examples in the New Testament, like, um, for example, uh, Philip. Would would it seem wise to you, just from human wisdom, for Philip to lead a blazing revival in Samaria, where miracles were happening and people were receiving the Holy Ghost, they were being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and all of these incredible things, would it seem reasonable for him to leave that revival and go down and find one man, a eunuch from Ethiopia in the desert? I mean, just really, just from the standpoint of human wisdom, that, that wouldn't seem too smart. Why should I leave this great revival? Well, if I leave here, things may fall apart. To go and talk to one man? But an angel came and gave Philip some direction. That's wisdom. Wisdom is profitable to direct. direct. And the angel said to Philip, I want you to leave here and go down to Gaza. You're going to find one man there, an Ethiopian eunuch, and he needs your help. And so, of course, you know Philip went down and how he shared Jesus with him from the book of Isaiah. And the man was converted, believed, was baptized, and, and, uh, and no doubt took that gospel message back to Ethiopia with him. It was wisdom. 
It didn't make any sense from a human point of view, but, but it was the wisdom of God. So there's just a couple of, of illustrations about how this works. I'm going to page 67 now. There's, there's other, other, uh, other illustrations there, of course. <clears throat> now, the word of wisdom often seems to be associated with a knowledge of Scripture. Now, if you're not willing to really soak yourself in the Word of God, I wouldn't expect too much in the area of the Word of Wisdom. Because it seems like this gift often operates in conjunction with the knowledge of Scripture itself. And where the gift of the Word of Wisdom operates, it seems to, pr to produce and to result in conviction, unanimity, in other words, agreement, like we mentioned with, in Acts 6 with the feeding of the widows, Progress, the work of God goes forward like with Philip. Open hearts and open doors of opportunity. If you look at all the examples we gave you, you'll see that. Wherever the word of wisdom operates, these things seem to follow. It's a supernatural revelation by the Holy Spirit of divine purpose. It's a supernatural declaration of the mind and will of God. It's the supernatural unfolding of His plans and purposes concerning things and places and people. Now, by virtue of being the gift of the Word of Wisdom, most often it operates by means of a spoken word. But I, I, I'm one who does not believe in limiting this too much. I believe it could work by means of a letter. For example, God may prompt you to write a letter to somebody. These days, a word of wisdom could be imparted probably by email or some other digital way. I don't know. But uh, it's just a communicating somehow of, of God's divine purpose. Now, the question, and whenever we talk about spiritual gifts, these kind of questions always come up. The question is, how do you know if God is wanting to use you in the word of wisdom? <clears throat> All we can tell you is what has happened. Again, I would never want to give you the impression that it has to be this way. Because God's a God of infinite variety. He can, in fact, the truth is, I believe that God is constantly speaking in many ways that we don't recognize. Because we tend to be pretty insensitive, or we don't expect God to, we have this expectation that God speaks only in certain ways, and so we may not even recognize when He is speaking. In fact, God can speak very clearly, but if we're not sensitive to that, we can miss it entirely. Do you remember the account in the Gospels once when there was a voice from heaven that spoke to Jesus? And there were people standing around who heard something. <laughs> they heard something. And some of them said, an angel has spoken to him. But others said... Oh, no, that was just thunder. You remember that from the New Testament? In other words, God can speak, but if we're not really sensitive and, and listening to hear His voice, we may miss what it was altogether and not even recognize it as the voice of God. We might pass it off as a clap of thunder. Or just a rumbling of some kind. But others say, that was the voice of God. Now, Here's how some folks have testified that this gift of the word of wisdom has operated for them in their life. Most people report that when it comes to vocal gifts like the word of wisdom, that it may originate in an impression. I don't know what else to call it other than an impression. It's like just a sensation or a feeling that God wants you to go to somebody and say something. I told you yesterday about the phone call that I received. Really, that was not a word of knowledge because the brother who was calling me told me, I don't know what's going on. God didn't tell him what was going on, but it was a word of wisdom. And it sent me to a couple of verses of Scripture that gave me great comfort and peace and direction in the midst of all that. Because one thing I knew for sure is that it wasn't God's will that I go rent a rider truck and back it up to my front door and I'll put everything into it and escape. That certainly wouldn't have been wisdom. But God gave me a word of wisdom by means of somebody's telephone call. How did it work for him? He said that he was awakened in the middle of the night, he said. And God impressed my name upon him and told him, call Brother Seagraves and give him these two verses of Scripture. 
That was as far as it went. He didn't know what they were about, but they were very appropriate. He had this impression, in other words. Or some folks have said it's like it's like a thought or words spring unbidden into my mind. In other words, I wasn't thinking about this. Just suddenly it's there. It's not I'm saying to God, okay, God, is there a word of wisdom you can give me for somebody necessarily? I mean, he could work that way because he wants to help people. But it's not necessarily that. Sometimes it just springs unbidden to the mind. You say, where did this come from? And I think Brother Billy Cole has said, usually when when God is dealing with you that way, usually your first response, you know, is to say, oh, this is probably just me. And then the second response will say, no, it's probably worse than that. It's probably the devil. <laughs> but the truth is, it's the Lord who would give you an impression to say or do anything that would be helpful to someone else. The devil's not going to do that. And your own natural mind doesn't work that way. We're far too self-centered to always have this altruistic concern about being helpful to somebody else. If that comes into our heart, no doubt it's the Lord who's giving us that impression. And... Uh, Some people have said that God will give them, in these vocal gifts, a complete message or word in advance to give to someone else. But my own assessment, and I have not done any scientific survey on this, but my own assessment of it is that's not the way it works for most people. For most people, God will give you just a little information. Just a word or two or three. just, Just a little bit of information and then... Many times when you begin to communicate that information, then the Lord will give you more to say. It just kind of then once you take that step of faith and and give what God has given you, then the rest of it comes. That's been my own experience, too. Um, Some, though, have reported they see the words to speak, like on a scroll let down from the sky or something or or on a big screen like this one here. Uh, Somebody I was talking to someone yesterday down in the. Down in the cafeteria, and they said that someone had told them they see it like on a ticker tape or something. Well, it doesn't matter how God communicates it. You know, we just want to be able to recognize when God is saying something to us. Some folks have said they see a visual picture of something. No words, but just a picture. And then they describe what they see in that picture in their own words. Now, no doubt there's an endless variety of ways that God can communicate this. But at some point in time, and this is what I want to challenge you with, at some point in time, you're going to have to be willing to take the risk, because God's not going to force you to do that. He's not going to shove you up to somebody and open your mouth and vibrate your vocal cords. At some point in time, you're going to have to be willing to take the risk. Now, I want to give you a little bit of advice here, and this will work on both word of wisdom and word of knowledge, and really on any of the gifts, but this is something that we always practiced in our signs and wonders classes here at the college and it it was helpful please remember this if you forget everything else remember this remember to be somewhat tentative about your statements in other words don't walk up to somebody and say yea I say unto thee thus saith the Lord as if it was coming down from Mount Sinai Because, first of all, these spiritual gifts are not the equivalent of the Scripture in authority. They are not extra-biblical revelation. This is not God writing something in stone here. The spiritual gifts operate through fallible human vessels, us. And even if it is from God, as it passes through our own mind, our own thoughts, our own values, and so forth... It may pick up a little bit of that along the way, just like water passing through a copper pipe may pick up a little bit of the taste of that pipe. So uh, what we have always practiced is, and it may sound kind of funny to you, but it's been very helpful and it works, is to say something like this. If you believe God has given you a word of wisdom or word of knowledge for somebody, say something like this. Say, I may be wrong. Just get that out of the way. But I believe that God is leading me to say thus and so to you. 
Now, if it is of God, it will be immediately confirmed in the heart of that person you're taking it to. They will receive, they'll recognize, this is God speaking to me. For you to say, I could be wrong, does not in any way diminish the effectiveness of it if it is of God. But if it's not of God, at least you've got a way out. <laughs> at least you've already said, I may be wrong. <laughs> and, and the truth is, as I said yesterday, it's a learning process. It really is. We don't just... We don't just naturally know how to hear the voice of God. We're, we're working against so many things in our world and so many voices around us that we have to learn how God speaks. This is like learning to read the Bible or something. We, you know, it is not something that comes naturally. And so, uh, you may say that in different ways, but what I'm saying is don't approach these vocal gifts in a dogmatic way. You know, this is God speaking to you, and if you don't receive this, you know, that you've got a spiritual problem. Don't, don't approach it that way. Again, God will confirm it if it really is of Him. Um, I, many times, we, when it gets into these vocal gifts, we tend to use them. And I'm, I'm saying use them advisedly. I don't know what else to say. But, but we tend to work in these vocal gifts the way we are used to hearing other people work in them. And for example, when it comes to, and this is not on tongues and interpretation here of prophecy, but when it comes to those gifts, you know, frequently people will start out those gifts saying, thus saith the Lord. The reason is not necessarily because God has given them the words, thus saith the Lord. That's just kind of an introductory part of it. But the reason is that's the way they're used to hearing God speak in the Bible. Because the Bible, you know, over and over again will say, thus saith the Lord. And so it's kind of a little introductory phrase to get into whatever it is God is saying. But we do have to remember it's not on the level of Scripture. Many people in these gifts, and again, especially, as I just mentioned, in the uh, uh, interpretation of tongues and prophecy, many people will give uh, the prophecy or the interpretation in King James English. And there's nothing wrong with that, but if you just stop and think a minute, we all know that God doesn't speak King James English. You know, the Bible was originally given in Hebrew and Greek with a little bit of Aramaic, not King James English. But, uh, but the reason we, we often hear it given that way is because, again, that's how we're used to hearing God speak. You know, we're used to reading the King James Version. And so that's the vocabulary and that's the way of expression that we're familiar with. And so we often use that. But obviously, if you're giving a, uh, an interpretation or a prophecy in France, you're not going to use King James English. Or in Mexico or somewhere. You know, it's going to be in a language that those people can understand and, and so forth. Um, and the same thing is true with the word of wisdom or word of knowledge. My own suggestion to you is it's better take the pressure off in these situations. And that's saying, you know, I may be wrong. That's kind of a little pressure reliever. But also take the pressure off in trying to adopt some sort of a facial expression or some sort of a... Uh, vocal uh, tone or something, you know, to, don't, don't think it's in the tone of voice, you know, that you have to have this spooky kind of voice or something. Don't think it's in, you know, how you look at it. That's not it. The whole point is the content of what you're saying. And again, if it is of the Lord, then it will be confirmed in their heart. Um, let's talk about the gift of the word of knowledge for a few minutes here, and then we'll come back and just give you some of my own experiences. Page 69, the gift of the word of knowledge, if you have the textbook there. Just like we mentioned on the word of wisdom, this is the word of knowledge. It's not all knowledge. Some folks, uh, the Lord uses them more prolifically in this than he does other people. But again, this is just a small portion of the total knowledge of God supernaturally imparted by the Holy Spirit. It's something that you do not know naturally that God makes you aware of. It's not psychic ability. We're not talking about that. That's phony stuff. Jesus, talking to this woman at the well, said, go get your husband. Now, apparently his tongue is kind of in his cheek when he says this because he knows the truth. She says, well, I don't have a husband. He said, that's right. You've had five. And the man that you're with now is not your husband. 
You say, yeah, but that was Jesus. That's true. But remember, again, he, he was an example for us in our ministry. Now, the truth is, he didn't say a whole lot to that woman about that. All he said was, go get your husband. She said, don't have one. He said, you've had five. The one you've got now is not your husband. Immediately, the Bible says, she says, sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Smart woman. <laughs> and she went back to her village and you know what she told the people in her village? She said, come see a man who told me all things that ever I did. Now, did Jesus really tell her everything she'd done from the time she was born until that day? No. But you see, when you, are, when you minister to someone in a word of knowledge, it seems to them as if, you're, as if their life is just an open book. It seems like, whoa, you know, God knows everything about me. Even though he may just actually communicate some little tidbit of information. Several other examples of that in the, in the life of Jesus. One, one of them that I always kind of chuckle at when I read it has to do with the conversion of Nathaniel. And, uh, you know, Nathaniel was this guy who, when uh, Philip, I believe it was, said to Nathaniel, you know, come, we, I, I'm going to take you to the Messiah, the, the promised one. And Nathaniel was so skeptical and so outspoken and so guileless, as Jesus later said. He said, who is it? And, and Philip said, well, it's Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathaniel said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? But he went. And when he got to Jesus, Jesus said, now watch this. We often just read over a lot of this stuff. Jesus said, behold an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. Now they've never met before. But Jesus says, this man is truly an Israelite and he is without guile. Now that means he's the kind of guy who says whatever he thinks. There's no, nothing hidden in him. I mean, if he thinks it, you know it. <laughs> Behold an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. And immediately, Nathaniel, who had been moments before so skeptical, immediately he said, how do you know me? And Jesus said, oh, I saw you when you were under the fig tree. Now, this is a word of knowledge. And you know what Nathaniel, I remember just moments before he'd been saying, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And now suddenly Nathaniel says, you are the Lord and the King. I mean, immediately he's converted just by a few little words like, here's a true Jew, no guile in him. Saw you under the fig tree, by the way. Wow! And suddenly he's a believer. You know, uh, that's, that's better than 12 weeks of search for truth. You know, I believe in search for truth, of course. We, we believe in home Bible study. But see, in other words, just a word from God cut through all of his skepticism right to the point of bringing him to a place of faith. Amen. <laughs> you can also see it in the book of Acts. Uh, sometimes kind of negative examples as well as positive. Uh, you look at um, Ananias and Sapphira, you know, who decided they were going to pull a fast one over on the apostles. And uh, sold their property and everybody else was bringing all the money and they decided to pretend that they were, but they kept back some of it. And they brought that to Peter. Peter had a word of knowledge. He said, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? You have not lied unto men, but unto God. And... The only two people who knew this in the natural realm were just Ananias and Sapphira. But God told Peter what was going on. Of course, right at that moment, there wasn't much of a revival to break out. Ananias dropped dead and later Sapphira did. But if you read on down in the chapter, later in the chapter, a great revival did break out as a consequence of all that. And, you know, I've heard some folks that have been kind of skeptical. Turn with me to the book of Acts here. I just want to show you one that's really interesting. Acts 9. I've heard some folks who are kind of skeptical about God giving people names or addresses. Ah, they say God wouldn't do that. Look at Acts chapter 9. Verses 11 and 12. Well, let's read verse 10. Acts 9, 10. This is after Saul had seen that bright light and was knocked down and he was in Damascus. 
And then in Acts 9, 10, Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias? And he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight. That's an address. And inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. Notice, God gave Ananias a name and an address. He said someone by the name of Saul of Tarsus is in the house of Judas on Straight Street. Now we're not finished yet. Verse 12. And in a vision he has seen, Saul has seen, a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Not only did God give Ananias Saul's name and address, he gave Saul Ananias' name. Does God give names? Well, of course he does. What, what good would a word of knowledge be if you didn't know who to say it to? Or where to go to get it? God gives that kind of information as well when it's needed. And if you read the whole story, you would also discover that God had given Ananias specific words about Saul's future ministry, or Paul as we commonly call him. He was going to be a vessel to preach the gospel to the Gentiles and all of that. And and when Ananias came in with this information, Saul was ready to receive him because God had already told Saul, somebody named Ananias is coming. He's going to lay his hands on you, so forth. Or how about the story of Peter in Acts chapter 10? Peter wasn't the most sensitive guy in the world, but, but even he, you know, is up on a rooftop, hungry, falls into a trance, sees a sheet let down from heaven three times. Could have worked on the first time, but he was so insensitive, he refused to hear the voice of God the first two times, and said, no, Lord, I'm not going to do that. And finally, he said, well, grudgingly, kind of, okay, I'll go. But God gave him specific direction. He said, there's three men at the gate. Go with them. That kind of stuff. God warned Paul of things which awaited him in Jerusalem. and all. The word of knowledge tends to produce conviction, confirmation, and preparation for some specific work that God is wanting a person to be involved in. I gave you a couple of illustrations yesterday, and, and there are others like that that have occurred in our Signs and Wonders class and Signs and Wonders seminars that we have done. And I don't know why this is. I'm just being open with you here today and telling you. But uh, what's what's happened a number of times in my own life is that God has given me names. Now, I wish that 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 he would be even more precise, because I know some folks that God will give the whole name to. The first name and the last name. And some folks, God will even give the address and the social security number. That gets pretty specific. Now, I'm not at that point. Yet, it'd be wonderful, but, but God has a number of times given me a name, and then that name is an open door to ministry to someone that is right there. That's, that's happened a number of times, and I was telling some folks at lunch yesterday, they were kind of asking questions about it as to how it works. Usually it's happened right in the meeting, but, but there, there's been also when God has given me a name even like two weeks in advance. When I was going somewhere to minister and God would say there's going to be somebody there by this name and etc. So I just keep that in mind till I get there. And um, but it may not be that way with you. It, it may work some other way. You just have to be open to how the Lord is going to to work in your own life. Keep in mind the things that I said about how we receive this information. It's pretty much the same as with the word of wisdom. That is, it could come in an impression, a thought or Word just unbidden, or you might see it, or, or something like that. Always be open to that. But when it comes to the word of knowledge, there's another dimension too. And that is, word of knowledge seems to sometimes work in harmony with the gifts of healings. And Brother Dukas may mention this in his, we worked together for many years in this, and he may mention this in his session today. Uh, when, you, when you go to minister healing to someone, God may give you a word of knowledge to help with this ministry of healing. And it sounds kind of strange, it almost sounds like it's not a word, but what we've experienced is that sometimes you may feel that other person's pain in your own body, right when you go there to minister. Not because you have the sickness or disease, but because God is showing you where they hurt. 
are showing you what the problem is. And after you minister to them, it goes. And, and, uh, and that is just God helping give you information and direction as to how to minister to that person. I do want to say this, because I know that skepticism enters in with these things. I do want to say that even if God speaks, if he speaks through you to another person in a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom or any other spiritual gift, prophecy or whatever it might be, that does not eliminate personal responsibility for the person who's received that ministry to do all he can in faithfulness and obedience. In other words, if God comes to you, let, let's say that, um, well, there could be many examples, but let's say, for example, you're having marital trouble. And, and the Lord sends somebody to you with a good word, a good news. You know, this marriage will be reconciled and etc. and whatever it might be. Now, that doesn't eliminate your responsibility to do everything you can do to have a good marriage. You can't go away from that word of knowledge and say to your spouse, well, God has said this is going to be reconciled, so Buster, you better straighten up and come around to my point of view. In other words, even though God has made a promise, that does not eliminate personal responsibility. God is saying, this is what I will do, Essentially, even though this may not be a part of the message, God is saying, this is what I will do if you are faithful and you do the right thing. So you're still responsible to be obedient to the word of God and to do the things that are right. And I think some folks have been confused over that because they said, well, God spoke to me, but it didn't happen. Well, now, wait a minute. Let's go back and let's look at the issue of your personal responsibility. Did you work with God here? And were you, were you led by his spirit? I mean, he's telling you what he wants to do, but he's not going to force something on you. Look, for example, uh, the, the Lord could call someone to preach. And that person could say, well, I'm just going to live the way I want to live and go out and live some loose and profligate lifestyle. Well, he'll never wind up preaching. Not because God doesn't want to use him, but because he has not been faithful in following the call that God had on his life. There's still that issue of personal responsibility. So we do have to keep that in mind. Now, yesterday here, we, we uh, did something that resulted in quite a number of people saying that God spoke to them in a specific way. And we were very happy about that. And I tried to emphasize yesterday that the spiritual gifts are no sign of God's approval of your doctrine or even of your character. They are gifts. Now, there's two things to consider about that. Number one, don't ever think because God is using you in a spiritual gift that this may, means that everything is okay between you and Jesus. That comes in the matter of your spiritual growth and character and the fruit of the Spirit. That's the first thing. God is not saying to you, okay, since you've been using a gift tonight, uh, you can forget about being faithful, you can forget about being a person of virtue and all that, you know, because you're gifted. No, 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 it has nothing to do with that. But then the other side of that is, and this may be a little difficult for us because we really struggle with this, don't dismiss the operation of a spiritual gift through someone whose lifestyle or even doctrine you may not approve of. Now this may be kind of a shocking concept, but it does work both ways. Remember, God spoke to Balaam through a donkey. That donkey had never spoken in tongues a day in his life and had never been baptized in Jesus' name. But God spoke through him anyway. Didn't necessarily mean that donkey's going to heaven. He's just a vessel of God, that's all. And I've said that for a reason. And I, I, I say this with a little hesitancy, but I think we've said enough that you'll all understand this and receive this. When I was pastoring in 1977, I believe that the Lord had led me, because previously I've been opposed to this idea, but I believe the Lord had led me and changed my heart to establish a Christian school. Now, for us, this was a major undertaking. And uh, we had to build the facility. We, we did have some uh, well-educated people who were qualified to work in it, but we had to build the facility. It was a big job, of course, to get a Christian school going. 
This is in the state of Illinois. And this was about in July or so of the year 1977. We were right in the middle of this building project, and I was very busy with it. And there was a man coming to St. Louis to do a crusade or a meeting, whatever he called, that all of you have heard of, I'm sure. His name was Kenneth Copeland. Now, I want to say right off the bat, I do not agree with Kenneth Copeland's theology. I have more differences with him than just the Trinity and baptism. I don't agree with a lot of stuff he teaches <laughs> without getting into all that now. But I have no sympathy for his theology. I'm not saying anything about him personally as far as his character. I don't know anything about that. But just his doctrine I don't, I don't agree with. But anyway, he was coming to St. Louis. He was going to do some kind of a crusade there. And I'd received a letter. He'd sent it to, I guess, pastors all over St. Louis inviting local pastors to come to a um, pre-conference meeting he was having with pastors. Well, I didn't intend to go because I was too busy. I figured it was just a promotional meeting for his crusade. And I did not intend to invite my people to go. And so I didn't plan to go to, to his little pre-conference meeting. But for some reason... As the day approached, in fact, on the specific day that he was having the meeting, I just felt this real strong impression I should go. I didn't know why. It was one of those stormy days in the Midwest. You know how it sometimes gets around St. Louis, Missouri. I mean, the rain was coming out of the sky like it was being poured in buckets. The lightning was flashing. The thunder was rolling. It was not a day to drive across the city of St. Louis from... I didn't even know where the meeting... I knew the address, but I'd never been there. It was not a day to go looking for some place you'd never been to, you know. But I just had this real strong impression I ought to go. Somebody yesterday was saying how hard she worked getting here. You know, what God said when she arrived. Had this strong impression I should go. And so I got in my car. I had the address there. I, I, it took me 45 minutes or so to drive to the place where, this, where it was going to be. When I got there, it seemed like the storm was centered in that location. I didn't have an umbrella. I grabbed a floor mat out of the car and put it over my head, jumped out of the car and ran into this building. Immediately when I jumped out of the car, I was over my shoes in water, and my, I was soaked to the skin through my suit But by the time I got into the building. It was not, uh, you know, the kind of thing you do just because you're casually interested in something. But I got in there, and I found the room where he was meeting with probably about 150 pastors. I knew one of them. In other words, I was in a strange place. I didn't know these people. And uh, I didn't fill out any piece of paper, didn't write my name down anywhere and say anything about myself. I sat down on the back row. And he was up teaching. I don't even know what he taught, but he taught along for a while. And when he got finished, I started to leave. I had things to go and do. But before I left, he said that he believed the Lord wanted him to minister to, to some people that day before we all left. And there were quite a few folks who lined up and he started ministering to them. And it didn't take too long for me to recognize, hey, even though I don't agree with this guy's theology, the Lord's doing something here. I got really interested. And so I went down toward the front. I never got in his prayer line. I mean, can you imagine a UPC preacher and Kenneth Copeland's prayer line? I never got in his prayer line. I just went down to look on, really. I just went down to observe. I wanted to get a closer look at what was happening. And as I stood there and watched this, suddenly he turned from the person he was ministering to and he turned around to me and he called me out of the crowd to the front. And God had given him a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge for our Christian school and how it was to operate, what I was to do to make it a success. And I'm telling you, it was God. <laughs> I still don't agree with his theology, but it was God who was speaking through him that day. Remember what I said about the donkey a while ago. Just keep that in mind. Now, I'm not calling him a donkey, but I mean God can speak however he wants to. <laughs> and God gave me this word of wisdom and this word of knowledge. My wife can tell you that when I got home that day, I almost didn't even have to walk up the stairs to get into the house. I just kind of floated right up there, you know. I was so thrilled because... Here we are in the middle of a, of a tremendous undertaking for us. A lot of money being spent, a lot of effort. And God has said to me, what you're doing is my will. And I'm directing you to do this, and here's how you're to operate this school. You know, a lot of Christian schools have opened and closed and, and just phased out. That was 1977, and that Christian school is still operating at maximum capacity to this day, even while other schools around it have closed out. Others are sending their kids there to go to school because God is the one who established this thing. It wasn't me. 
In fact, we, uh, in conjunction with that, we started what we called the Bi-State Convention. This was in like 1979 or 80, somewhere along in there, where we invited Christian schools to come together, you know, for oneness Pentecostal schools. And, and uh, that the very first year, I think we had like a little over 100 students there, but it's still going on. And I got word this year they had, I believe it was 800 and some odd students who attended that, that convention. Still going on and God is still blessing. But see, for me, and I wanted to tell you that, so I know it's a little risky to tell that because somebody could go out of here and say I'm approving of Kenneth Copeland's ministry. I'm not. I don't agree with it. I'm just being very upfront about that. But what I, the reason I even tell that story is because God may speak to you in some way you didn't anticipate. He could speak to you in a wide variety of ways. Be open to that. Or, on the other hand, He may use you to speak to somebody you never thought God would ever have a word for. It could be your next door neighbor. They may be Roman Catholics. You mean God might want to say something to them? <laughs> Well, I think he loves them, doesn't he? He wants them to be saved too. Uh, you know, God, God may use you in some way you never anticipated. So what we want to do is we want to be sensitive to the voice of God. However he's speaking, whatever he wants to say. Um, because when he speaks, it takes the situation into a completely new dimension. Now, it's time for us to close this session. The others may be waiting to come in. But let's take a moment and pray here. And, uh, and I just want to pray that, and I, I can't do it, I, you know, there's nothing magic that I can do, but I want to pray that God would help you to learn to recognize His voice when He speaks. You, you may be driving down the road and He may speak to you in the car. You, you could be in a, in a wide variety of ways in a situation where God may speak to you. How many of you want God to speak? You want to hear the voice of God? Okay, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your wonderful concern for us, for your tender heart, and for your desire to do good things in our lives. And I pray today, O oh Lord, that you would help all of us. I'm especially praying for my brothers and sisters here today. Help them to recognize your voice when you speak. Give them a sensitivity to the promptings of your Holy Spirit. Even now, Lord, you may be dropping your thoughts into their mind. And if so, give them the courage to do with that what you want them to do. If it's to call someone and say something. If it's to go to somebody or to write a letter or whatever it may be, give them the courage to do that. Lord, we thank you for these spiritual gifts. They're not just toys, but they're ways that we receive great strength and courage from you. And I pray in the name of Jesus that you would use us in these spiritual gifts according to your will and direction. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, why don't we stand up and just worship the Lord for a moment and uh, thank Him for His good blessings. Hallelujah.